So if you're a complete beginner to the Insta360 Ace Pro, today's video is for you. In this video, I'm gonna unbox and set up the brand new Insta360 Ace Pro. I'm gonna show you all of the settings that I recommend for getting the very best footage, photos, time lapses, and more from this camera. Wow, that's a lot. Now, since there will be a lot of content in this video, I have created a table of contents below so that you can easily navigate this content if you need to skip ahead or if you need to go back and revisit a section. That table of contents will make it nice and easy for you to do so. We are venturing into a wilderness area that recently had a 12,000 acre forest fire. It just reopened this section of the AT. And I'm gonna set up a second camera here so you can get a real close look at this camera as I unbox it. All right, so we're gonna get the plastic off here. And as a note, I did buy this camera with my own money. This camera was not sent to me. Therefore, any opinions I express in this video are the opinions of my own. There's a nice little magnet right here. I like that touch on the box. Some of these boxes are pretty tricky to open. This one's a nice design. And when you open it up inside here, you've got a nice instructions here that show you exactly what to do here for putting in a micro SD card, how to flip up the screen, how to mount it, and how to uninstall the mount. So that's pretty cool. Of course, right here, we have the actual camera. Initial impressions when picking this up is this actually feels really solid. I can tell already that this weighs a little more than the GoPro or the DJI Osmo Action 4. And when I first looked at it, I thought it would be kind of plasticky feeling, but this feels more metal than plastic. So initial impressions there are good. I like a good solid build quality. So we're gonna set that aside for a moment. We're gonna look at what else we have here in the box. Pull this out and inside here, we have a USB-C to USB-C cable. That would be a charging and data cable. And it looks like we've got a couple mounts in here. This is gonna be an adhesive mount. This one is meant for one-time use only. So keep in mind, wherever you mount this, you don't want to unstick it again. It's not gonna be able to re-stick. It's uh, stuck that way. And right here, we also have the magnetic mount. Nice little mount here. And that's going to clip on the bottom here. I'll show you that in a moment. And in addition, we have some manuals inside here. Set that aside. And otherwise in the box, that's all that we have in here. Like the packaging. Very nice. We're going to set that aside as well. All right. So next, we're going to pull some of these stickers off the Ace Pro. Pull that back one off. Pull the one on the bottom off. And we've got another one on the front screen here. And finally, we have one on the lens here. And if you look closely at the lens, you'll notice Leica right there. If you haven't heard of Leica before, Leica is a well-known camera manufacturer. They have top of the line quality cameras. So anytime something's engineered with Leica, that usually gives you a heads up right away that it's going to be great visual quality. So I like seeing Insta360 teaming up with Leica. Now do note this lens cover here is not designed to be removable. So if you do scratch or damage this, it's not replaceable without sending it into Insta360. However, there are ND filters for this lens. I'll be featuring those in an upcoming video, but Insta360 does make ND filters for this camera and those go over top of this. So let's talk about the exterior of this first before we power it on. Let's start with this side. Right here is of course the battery door. So we open it up and the battery is inside already. And on this camera, the micro SD card is not in the battery slot. It's actually going to be on the other side, which I'll show you in a moment. So the battery door latches nice and secure there. And if we go to the other side, this is the power button right here. So in a moment, I'm going to power it on hitting that button. Then down here is the USB-C port as well as the micro SD card slot right here. So I'm going to use this opportunity to put a micro SD card in. And Insta360 does have a list of recommended micro SD cards on their website. I recommend checking it out before you purchase a card. But basically the SanDisk Extreme, those are pretty much supported by this camera. So when you put in the micro SD card, you want to have the text facing toward the lens right here. So you want to put it in like this and we're just going to get it to click down into place. If you do try to put it in the other way, there will be a lot of resistance. You don't want to keep pushing on it because it could break something. Once that's in there, we're going to close the door here and coming around to the top. This, of course, is the record button right here. So anytime you want to start a video recording or stop it, or take a photo or start a time lapse, anything like that. This will be the button you hit right here. And then on the bottom here, this is where you would attach the magnetic mount. So the magnets will only let you put this mount on in one direction and it's going to be this way. So the text that says Insta360, it's going to be here toward the front of the camera. And this does have nice strong clips. You want to make sure both of those click into place on each side here. And once those are in, this is very secure. 
This is not going to just detach from the camera. Super secure there. Very secure down here, huh? You actually have to push in on both of these in order to get it to release. So great job on that design there. Going to attach this here and make sure both clips clip into place. And finally, as you may have guessed by the photo on the box here, the screen flips up. So let me show you how that works. What you do is you grab on here. You have to squeeze these in in order to release the screen and then it flips up. So if you have this camera facing you and you want to see yourself while filming, it's great for vlogging. You've got that larger than two inch screen right here. You can see everything that's going on. And of course, if you are filming and you want to have the screen tilted up so you can reference it, say you're pointing up at something and you want the screen here or pointing down, you want the screen at a different angle. It's very useful for that. And behind the screen are some instructions for cleaning the camera after using it in seawater. So if you want to know how to clean it properly after putting it into the ocean, these are the instructions right here. And then I tasted the salt water on my fingers. And in order to put it back into place, just push down gently and you'll hear a click and it should click into place on both this side and this side. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to power on this camera. And I'm sure when I initially powered on and connect to the app, there's going to be that initial firmware update. So we're going to do that first here. And when I power it on, you see the menu there. I'm going to select English. And next thing it's going to do is it's going to ask us to connect it to the Insta360 app. So if you haven't already downloaded the app on your phone, you'll want to make sure to do that. That will be necessary in order to activate your camera. There's not a way to activate it without using the app. So I'm going to bring up the app on my phone here and we're going to get this connected. So when we bring up the Insta360 app here, it's going to prompt us to connect to the camera. Just want to make sure you have Bluetooth on. You're going to click connect now and it's going to proceed to connect to it. And then it's going to say that there's new firmware found. It's going to list all of the things that that firmware has included in it. And then you're going to click start to download. It's going to proceed to download and it's going to go pretty quickly unless you have a really slow internet connection, then it could take a little bit. My internet's not the fastest, but it's going along pretty quickly here. All right, so next it's going to connect to Bluetooth. And then on the device here, it's going to have a confirm option that we need to click. So I'm going to click confirm and then it's going to proceed to finish connecting and we're going to have to click join so it can pair to Wi-Fi. And then once we connect to Wi-Fi, it's going to push the firmware update to the camera and it's going to get it installed. I'm going to click upload firmware file to device and your phone's going to quickly copy it over via that Wi-Fi connection direct to your Ace Pro. And then it's going to give you a nice little status bar here down at the bottom of the app as it updates the firmware. It's moving along pretty quickly. I won't show the entirety of the 100% of this update process, but it's generally going to take about two minutes. And on your camera, it's going to say, please keep the camera turned on and wait. So I'm going to do that. This is what it'll look like on the camera. And it's going to take us back to the screen there. And it's going to say, please reconnect the device. Insta360 has come a long way. This used to be kind of buggy with some of their older cameras, but the connection is very smooth and it seemed to work very fast and very well. So props to Insta360 on that. So now that we've updated the firmware, we need to reconnect it in the app to do the initial activation process. So we're going to click down there and we're going to click join here and we're going to click activation. And if you want to register now, you can get an extra three months warranty for your camera, but I am going to register later. All right. So now that we've updated our firmware, it's going to take us to this screen next. This is showing you the different ways to toggle various things on your camera. So if you want to switch modes, you're going to toggle left or right. And you can see that here. And we're going to get into all of these modes and all of the settings for those in a little bit. If you want to access the shooting parameters, you're going to swipe left from the edge of the screen. It's going to bring those up. We'll also get into these as well. And then you can slide up to access the shooting specs, which are these right here. Really like this menu. This is a little bit different on the Ace Pro from some of the other Insta360 products, but I really like that menu. And then swipe down. That's going to access a lot of the key settings up here in this menu which we're going to go through first before we get into the specific best settings for the various modes. And then if you want to access your album, you're going to swipe right and that's going to show you your album. Basically anything you've recorded on here, it's going to show when you swipe right. So I'm going to click got it. And first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to swipe down and we're going to dive into this upper menu. So on this upper menu, there are eight different buttons here. First one, if we click on that, that's going to enable quick capture and quick capture is basically you can power on your camera and immediately have it start recording by hitting the record button. You don't have to push the power button over here. So if you want to enable that, that's how you enable it right there. 
And when you enable any of these modes, they're going to be highlighted blue. And when they're not enabled, they're going to be gray like they currently are by default. Next mode here is rotation lock on. So basically, if you have rotation lock on, your screen is not going to auto rotate. If you turn it like this to portrait mode, it's not going to go into portrait mode. It's going to stay in landscape. Or if you start off in portrait mode and you go back like this, it's not going to go back to landscape. I recommend keeping it locked. I don't like my orientation changing when I'm using the camera. So I'm going to keep that locked there. This next button here is gesture control. So if you turn that on, it actually has some nice little video gesture examples here and it shows you different ones. So if you want to go through those and learn those, the palm, for example, you can start or stop your video recording by holding up your palm. So it's pretty neat that they built that into here. And then there's a whole bunch of examples you can go through. I'm going to keep gesture control off for now. I personally don't use that, but it is a nice feature if you want to use that. Over here is the voice control. Similar to gesture control, you can use different voice commands to do different things with this camera, like start recording, stop recording, that type of thing. If you turn it on, you then would select a language and it's going to show you the different voice commands. So if you want to use that, that's where you would activate it. Similar to gesture control, I don't use voice control, so I'm going to keep that off. Over here, there's a pre-recording option. And this is basically that hindsight type of option. If you turn it on and have this enabled, your camera's basically always recording internally. And when you hit that, it's going to go back to the 30 seconds or the 15 seconds, and it's going to put that footage into a file and save it. So this is especially good if you're doing a fishing video, if you're at a sporting event and you're waiting for something exciting to happen. It'll go back and get the preceding 15 or 30 seconds, depending on how you have it set. In case I get a hole in one. <laughs> so it's a great feature for that type of use case. So the AI Highlight Assistant, basically, if you use that, the AI is going to find highlights in your video and it's going to select those for you. So if you're in a mode where that's available, you can use that and it'll do that for you. Next button here is the screen brightness. I recommend keeping that 100%, but if you want to save a little bit of battery power, you can lower this down, but I recommend not going any lower than about 80%. If you go lower than that, it can be sometimes hard to get an accurate readout of what you're actually filming. Then over here is if you want to lock the screen, this is useful if you're in water. That way the water's not pressing on your screen and changing settings on you. And then if you want to unlock it, just slide up and it'll unlock it. So if we swipe over, there's another menu here of eight different buttons. This one is the prompt sounds. I usually keep that at low or medium. I don't like them to be too loud. I'm gonna keep it at low. Next button here is the indicator lights off or on. I like to keep the indicator lights on. I like to know when it's recording or when it's not. So I'm gonna keep those on. This next button is the grid. And this is gonna be the couple lines sideways and vertical. I like having that grid on. It helps me with framing whatever I'm filming, so I'm going to keep that on. Over here is the audio settings. So by default, it's on wind direction, but you also have stereo or direction focus. If you want to get really good sound from this camera, I recommend using an external mic, which you can connect via the USB-C port on here. And also the Bluetooth on here does support the DJI Wireless Mic 2. So if you happen to own a different camera that this came with, but you also want to use the Insta360 Ace Pro. This mic does pair to this camera via Bluetooth. So it's a great feature. If you have the original DJI mic one, you also can use the connector via the USB-C port and those mics will work with this as well. So all that to say, if you're gonna use the audio out of here and you're in a really windy environment, that could be useful, but you'll find it could make your voice quieter and louder randomly. And that's not always helpful. It doesn't always keep it consistent. So I don't recommend that for good audio unless you're in a really windy environment and you don't have an external mic. In general, I would recommend using the stereo or the direction focus. The stereo is gonna be all around and the direction focus is going to be whichever way the camera's facing, that's gonna be the audio that it picks up. But since I'll be using an external mic with this, I'm going to keep it on wind reduction. That way, if I forget my mic, I'll have that as a backup option. If you click this down here, this is timed capture. So you can actually set the time that you want this to start and your camera is going to turn on and start capturing. So this is especially useful if you want to do a star lapse. A lot of people will set that timer and you can set your camera outside, have it plugged into an external power bank like this one from Anchor that I recommend. And your camera will start going. It'll start the time lapse 
and you can have it running all night if you want to. You can set the duration there. It's very cool. You can set all your specs here too, and you can adjust the parameters, the field of view, the repeat frequency. Very cool. I don't usually use time capture. I like to just set up stuff manually, but if you want to, Insta360 has made that possible on here. This next one here is for the Bluetooth remote. Insta360 does make a Bluetooth remote that you can use to control the camera. So if you own that, this is where you would pair it right here. And the next one here, if you have AirPods, AirPods can pair via Bluetooth to use them as mics on here as well. And then this one right here is where we get into some of our more detailed settings. So we're gonna go down through here. This is just your camera info at the top. So it's gonna show the device type, the serial, the firmware, the hardware, and some other settings here. And it also has the export log down here at the bottom. This can be helpful if you're troubleshooting any issues with Insta360, they may ask for that export log to help narrow down the issue. Under the general menu, you have the option to keep the vibration turned on if you want to. I like to keep it on. It's kind of an extra bonus to go along with those lights so that you know when you start and stop recording. There's the option to have a long press to cancel recording. So on this camera, if you start a recording and let's say you record for a couple minutes, but you decide, hey, I don't want that recording. You can actually have the option to hold down and long press when you stop it. When you long press, it's going to prompt you if you want to cancel that recording. So that is a cool option to enable. There's also a Bluetooth wake up feature. There's an external mic gain feature here. So if you have an external mic gain attached and you want to have some gain on that, you can do that right here. I'm gonna keep that at zero for now. The auto power off options, I do recommend keeping that at three minutes. That way, if your camera's on for three minutes with no activity, it'll power off automatically. That way it doesn't drain your battery on you, just in case an accidental power on happens. For the screen auto sleep, the default is 90 seconds. I recommend sticking with that, but then where it says screen off during recording, I recommend unchecking that. I personally don't like the screen to go off while I'm recording, unless I was using my phone and viewing the footage through my phone, then that's okay. If your screen does go off during recording though, it will save additional battery life for you. So that is something to consider if you decide to do that. Front screen display, that's gonna have the display right here. I'm gonna keep that on, I like having that on. And then also the option to touch to activate when off. I recommend keeping that on as well. We're gonna go down to this next menu. For the Wi-Fi settings, I like to just keep those at auto. And then you've got some really detailed options here if you connect a charger, these are under the power off charging. If you go down here and click charge and record, you have a bunch of different settings you can customize here, like stop recording when power source is disconnected, shooting mode, specification, shooting parameters, whole bunch of stuff here. I like to usually keep this on charge only. I don't want power connecting to this to do anything else. I just want it to charge the camera. So that is something to keep in mind though. You can really unlock some advanced settings there if you want to. For the image settings for the auto flicker, if you're in the United States, I recommend doing 60 hertz. If you're in most other countries, you'll want to do 50 hertz. This can help prevent flicker in certain settings, but it doesn't guarantee it'll prevent all flicker because certain artificial lighting is very prone to doing flicker and this will not necessarily prevent that. Video sharpness, I personally prefer low. I don't want sharpness baked into my video too high from the camera. I can always add the sharpness later on when editing, but if you're not planning to do any advanced editing on your videos and you just wanna pull clips out of your camera to share, then I recommend trying out medium. Medium will probably give you the best results for that use case. For the video encoding, I definitely recommend the H.265. That's going to unlock the highest resolution and frame rate options available on this camera. For the bitrate, I definitely recommend keeping that set to high. This camera has a bitrate that can go all the way up to 170 megabits per second, which is a pretty high bitrate compared to a lot of other action cameras. Most others go to about 120 or 130 megabits per second. Down here is where you set your language and date and time. SD card, I'm going to format this SD card, but do note before you format an SD card, it is going to wipe everything on the SD card. So keep that in mind when you click it. And this camera actually gives you a prompt letting you know that not all cameras do that. This one does. So I'm going to click confirm and it's going to format the card and format was successful. And the gyroscope calibration, this camera does have gyro data in it in certain modes, which is great. If you want to use the Insta360 app later on to stabilize and reframe your footage, that way the stabilization is not baked into it. And you also can use Gyroflow. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but there is a mode on here 
where it will only capture the gyro data and it won't do the in-camera stabilization. That's what you'd want to use if you want to stabilize later on. I'm going to first place this on a horizontal surface as shown and I'm going to click start and it's going to give me five seconds to get my hands off to make sure there's no shaking there. And then it's going to say processing calibration was successful in about one second. So that was easy. I recommend doing that the first time just to make sure your gyro is calibrated. That's important. There's a reset tutorial here. It'll reset the tutorial, but not the camera settings. So those things that it showed at the beginning with the different menu controls, you would get those to pop up again if you did that. If you do want to reset the entire camera, you'd click reset camera. You'd click confirm. It won't delete any files, but it will reset all of the menus and every setting on the camera if you do that. And then down here is certification info. And that is it for the main menu. So let's start diving into those best settings that I recommend for this camera, depending on your use cases. So I'm gonna go through a few different ones to kind of help you figure out what's gonna work best for you. So the first thing I'm gonna do here, you can swipe either left or right, but I want to get to the main video mode right here. And it's gonna tell you you can double tap to zoom. You can do two times zoom on this camera without it digitally zooming. In other words, you're not gonna lose the quality of your footage or the resolution by zooming in. So that is a nice feature about this camera. Part of the reason for that too is because it does support 8K video. When you're in 4K, that gives you the room to zoom without losing the quality because of that. So that is really neat. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna click down here at the bottom. And what I recommend here, if you want to get the very best quality footage out of this camera, and you don't want to slow it down at all or anything like that, I do recommend selecting 8K, 24 frames per second. That gives you a lot of room later on if you want to crop that and reframe it when you're editing. And it's great to have that higher resolution without losing the quality of your video. So I do recommend doing that if you want to edit later on and if you don't want to slow it down. And of course, 8K footage can be kind of demanding whatever device you're editing it on. So keep that in mind. If your device cannot handle 8K editing, then I recommend sticking with 4K. For the stabilization, you can turn it off if you're using a gimbal or something like that. But if you're not using a gimbal, I recommend keeping it set to standard in most use cases. So when you're setting your ratio, a couple things to keep in mind. If you're using 8K mode, you can only do 16 by nine or 2.35 to one. If you set it to four by three, it's only gonna let you do 4K. It's not gonna let you do 8K. So for 8K, I'm going to keep it set to 16 by nine. If you want to do the 2.35 to one, that's that real widescreen look to your footage and you can do that and get good results with that. But you also can do that later on when editing if you want to. But if you want that look right out of the camera, you'll want to set it there. For the duration, I'm going to put this to infinity. I don't want there to be a limit on the duration of the clip. But if you do want to do that, you can adjust all kinds of parameters here, anywhere from 15 seconds all the way up to three hours. So once I've set those parameters, I'm gonna swipe in from the left and over here, we're gonna set some of our settings here and I'm gonna click on the M. There are several different color mode options on here and the standard one is gonna give you the best results. If you don't want to do any grading later on, you can keep it at standard. There's also vivid if you want that more contrasty, saturated type of video, you'd wanna go with vivid. If you're gonna grade later on, I recommend using flat. That's gonna be the mode that I use most of the time because I don't like having the color saturation baked into the footage or the contrast. I like to fine tune that later on. So I recommend flat if that's the use case that you have. There are also some different biking settings here. There's biking one, which is cooler. Biking two, there's urban, there's snow, there's night, there's ocean. There's a bunch of profiles. So I recommend a lot of those other profiles for you if you're just gonna get a clip out of the camera and export it to share and you don't really wanna do any editing maybe a little bit of editing in the Insta360 app. Those are perfect for that use case. But in most cases, I do recommend just sticking with standard unless you do want to grade it later on, in which case I recommend flat. For the EV comp over here, I recommend doing negative 0.5. It's gonna ensure that your highlights don't get blown out. A lot of times with smaller sensors and cameras, those highlights can easily get blown out. So I like to have it a little bit underexposed. That way you can bring those out later on and still have the details there. There is also a face priority mode for the metering mode. So the camera, the AI and the camera will detect faces and it'll expose and prioritize the exposure for a face. And then you also can do matrix. So if you're gonna be doing a lot of vlogging or video footage where people are in it, 
I recommend sticking with face priority. If you're not, I recommend sticking with matrix. And down here, we've got our low light stabilization option. So basically what this does is you've seen it before. When you're using cameras with EIS, electronic image stabilization, it can get kind of weird. There can be a lot of ghosting and jitter in low light. So if you are going to use this in low light, you'll want to turn this on. This shows you right here what it's going to do, but it's going to improve motion blur and picture stability. When the ambient light is too dark, the brightness of the screen will decrease, which may cause flickering. So I'm going to click don't remind me again and got it. If you're in low light, I definitely recommend turning that on. And in a little bit, I'm going to show you a mode on this camera that's dedicated to low light filming. But in any other mode, I do recommend turning that on if you're going to be in low light. That's going to help prevent that ghosting and jitter. And it's going to do that by boosting the ISO on here instead of slowing down the shutter speed. Because basically, once you get a shutter speed slower than about 1 over 200, that footage is going to be very hard to stabilize without it looking bad electronically. For now, I'm going to keep that off because I don't plan to use this mode for low light shooting. Then down here for the white balance, I like to set a static value for white balance. And generally, I like to set it at 5000K. It's going to just be my general daytime filming white balance. If you are filming around sunrise or sunset, I recommend doing 6500 or 7000K. I'm going to go back to 5000K here. And if you do click manual here, you do have some additional controls you can set. You can manually set the shutter here to a whole bunch of values. And of course, the shutter speed can go all the way down to as slow as your frames per second. And it can go all the way up to 1 over 8000, which is super fast shutter speed. In general, unless you're using ND filters, which Insta360 does make for this camera, but in general, you're going to want to keep the shutter set to auto if you're not doing that. So generally for ISO, I recommend setting the ISO max to 800 max. In the low light mode on here, the ISO can actually boost all the way up to 6400. I'm going to show that to you in a moment. But for this normal mode, I recommend doing 800 max and not having the ISO go any higher. And as you can see, if I toggle between my manual settings and my auto, some things change there. The manual mode does not support the uh, matrix for the metering mode, so keep that in mind. But I'm going to keep this on manual here with the settings that I keyed in. And the nice thing is it shows them all right here on the side, which is really nice. And then down here in the lower right, you're going to see a button here. And this is for the lens, so if you want to keep it to ultra wide, that's going to be the default there. This is the ultra wide with me facing the camera. And as long as you keep the human subject yourself in the middle, there won't really be distortion on you, but around you, it's going to have a nice wide angle, but there is also going to be distortion. You can see the tree there on the side, how it's all bent, but that tree in actuality is straight. So keep that in mind. And then you also can do D warp and D warp is going to be that linear mode. So all of your lines are going to look straight. There's not going to be that fisheye effect. But there, of course, is going to be a little bit of crop on the image. So if you're filming stuff where you don't want it to have fisheye like buildings or people, if you don't want them to be distorted, I recommend D-Warp. If you just want that real wide angle look to your footage, then I recommend sticking with Ultra. Either mode is a good choice depending on what you're doing. And it gives you suggestions here depending on what you're doing. D-Warp, it recommends this for scenarios like skiing, vlogging, etc. And by the way, the lens on this camera the equivalent focal length is 16 millimeters, which is a great choice by Insta360. That's a good wide angle for vlogging. So once you've keyed in all these settings, I recommend saving them as a preset. So to do a preset, you're going to swipe left or right in the middle and you're going to click preset and you're going to go over here and you're going to click the plus sign. And for this one, I'm going to call it custom number one. And it's going to show all the settings that we keyed in right here at the bottom. So I'm going to click save and it's going to save that custom one right there. So as I mentioned before, that's what I recommend for just standard talking to the camera, as long as you have a device that can edit 8K video. If you don't, then I recommend all these same settings, but I recommend going down to 4K 24 or 4K 30. So since I just unboxed this, the battery's not fully charged. It's starting to run a little bit low. So I'm actually going to plug it in here with a handy Anchor USB-C charging cable, and we're going to get it charging. And by the way, up here, this shows your micro SD card and how much time is left on it in that mode. So in the current 8K mode, we could record an hour and 38 minutes to the card. And this is a 128 gigabyte micro SD card. So that may be helpful for you to gauge how much you can record to it. When I change modes here and resolutions, that's going to adjust automatically with how much space is left. So I'm going to set up one more mode here in video. So I'm going to click on video here. 
and I'm gonna go to 4K. This is gonna be my slow motion mode without being extreme slow motion. If you want the extreme slow motion, I definitely recommend setting up a 4K 120 mode on a 24 frames per second timeline. You can slow that down to 20% of the original speed. And on a 30 frames per second timeline, you can slow that 4K 120 down to 25% of the original speed. So it's either gonna be five times slow-mo on a 24 frames per second timeline or four times slow-mo on a 30 frames per second timeline. But I often like to film in 4K 60 because it's kind of got the balance of both worlds. You can slow it down by about half, but you also can change this to the four by three ratio. And that gives you a lot of reframing flexibility later on vertically. You can put that on a 16 by nine aspect ratio timeline. You have some extra footage above and below where you can reframe or add motion to your footage. So that's great there. And then I'm gonna keep all these other settings over here the same. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to set this to de-warp as well. But in this mode, you do also have a horizon lock option. So if you set horizon lock, this is gonna keep it locked all the way to a certain angle. And looks like it's gonna be about right around 27 to 30 degrees. If you go beyond that, it's going to unlock the horizon, but until then it will stay locked. That of course does introduce a slight crop into your footage. So I'm gonna go back here to de-warp. I feel like de-warp is the best balance here if I don't want that ultra wide with the distortion. So I'm gonna keep it set to de-warp. And then now that I've keyed in all those settings, I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna go to preset and I'm gonna set this as custom two to confirm everything looks good down there and I'm gonna click save. And now that I've set my two key video modes, I'm gonna go over here to Pure Video. And Pure Video is a new feature that Insta360 has developed. And this is specific for low lighting. So the Pure Video is gonna do some fancy AI stuff inside the camera to reduce the noise and give you really good looking low light footage. So to set the parameters here, first of all, Pure Video only supports up to 4K 30. So keep that in mind. I'm personally going to do 4K 24 here. And with the ratio, you also can only do it in 16 by 9. So you can't do any other ratios with the pure video mode. And if you swipe here from the left, your options are going to be pretty limited for this as well. And if you keep this set to auto, it's going to automatically adjust your white balance. And it's going to tend to favor a white balance that's more in those colder tones, which is great for the correct white balance for nighttime. However, I like to manually set it that way if I need to adjust it later on in all of my footage. It's going to be the same exact value. Now for nighttime footage, a white balance of 3200K to about 4000K is a good range. I generally like to do about 3800K for my white balance for nighttime footage. And then for the EV comp, for nighttime footage, I actually keep that at zero. The nighttime auto features are pretty good on here. There's not really a need to worry about highlights getting overexposed at nighttime. And then if you want that stabilization enhanced in low light environments, you can turn it on here. I do recommend turning it on here because this mode is dedicated to low light filming. Therefore, I recommend having it on. If you go to manual over here, there are some other settings you can change. You can do the shutter speed here and you can change the ISO. And like I mentioned earlier, the ISO does go all the way up to 6400 in this pure video mode, but I recommend just keeping it set to auto here just because of the noise reduction built into the camera it does do a really good job and it's only going to go up to 6400 if it needs to. And for the shutter, I'm also going to put that back to auto. And if you want to change your lens here, there is action, which compresses the space even further for an immersive first person view. It says this is great for skiing, cycling and more. There's also the ultra here and then there's the de-warp once again. In general, I recommend the de-warp unless you do have a use case for that really wide mode. I'm gonna to go to this free frame video mode next. And if you click here, this explains what this is. This basically allows you to apply the flow state stabilization and horizon lock with adjustable aspect ratio via the app or studio when you're done filming. So this is that mode I mentioned earlier. If you want to use the gyro data from the camera later on, either in the app on your phone, the Insta360 Studio app on a computer or gyro flow, this is the mode you'd want to use right here. Now, there are a couple things to note. First of all, you can only go up to 4K 60 in this mode, but you can use the ratio of four by three, which is perfect for this type of mode. So I'm gonna keep that set to the default of 4K 60. And you also can turn on these guides right down here with the plus sign if you want to. This is gonna kind of give you a guide of how it's likely to crop that later on when you're reframing it. So it can be helpful to keep that on. 
I find it looks a little weird when I'm filming, so I usually just keep it off. But if you want to turn it on, you can. And here you can do a bunch of different things. You can do de-warp. You can do the 45 degree horizon lock, or you can do the 360 horizon lock, which is pretty wild. But it does mention the effect can only be viewed after exporting via the app. So it's up to you, depending on what you're looking for with your footage. I'm going to keep this in ultra wide because in this type of mode, the free frame, I like to have as much field of view to work with later on. Then when I'm reframing it and stabilizing it, there's going to be a little bit of a crop anyway, and I can remove the distortion at that point if I want to. So for this mode, I'm going to keep ultra and then we can swipe left and set the parameters here. So I'm going to go to my flat color mode right here and I'm going to do the EV comp of negative 0.5. And then I'm going to go over to the M here just to set a few more parameters. I am going to keep the shutter set to auto and the ISO here. I'm going to do auto, but I'm going to set it to 800 max in this mode. I'm going to be using this in the daytime. I don't want it to go higher than 800. And then the white balance, I'm going to set this manually. I'm going to set it to 5000 K once again. So all of my clips match later on when editing. And I'm going to swipe again so I can go up here and set a preset. And I'm going to add this as custom setting three and I'm going to save it. All right. So we've now set up the standard video modes. We've set up the pure video and we've set up the free frame. So the next item on the list here is going to be time shift. And this is basically a hyperlapse. And that explains it right there. So for the hyperlapse mode, I pretty much keep all the same settings here. I do recommend keeping the stabilization turned on and I recommend doing standard for that. And you can only do 4K 30 for this. There's no other settings to change there. And then if you swipe in from the left, I'm going to change the settings I have in the other mode. So I'm going to go down and do flat. I'm going to do auto for the shutter. I'm going to do 800 max for my ISO. EV comp, I'm going to do negative 0.5. And white balance, I'm going to do manual and I'm going to do 5,000. That way any time shifts that I get, those can be matched up in my video footage later on and go nicely together in a project. So I'm going to keep all those settings set there. And next, we're going to go to time lapse. So time lapse mode here. I love time lapse modes on these cameras. They're great cameras for this. So what I'm going to do for time lapse, I'm going to keep the stabilization off. And for the shoot length, I'm going to keep that set to infinity. For the ratio, I'm going to do four by three. I like to get that full sensor readout so I can add some motion later on to my time lapses. Now for the interval, if you're shooting this during the day, I recommend a two second or five second interval if you're doing like a couple hour time lapse. If you're doing a multi-day one, then of course you're gonna wanna go up here much higher. Or if you're doing it all day, you might wanna go higher as well. But generally I like to have two seconds if I'm doing a sunset or a shorter type time lapse. But if it's gonna be a longer daytime one, I keep it set to five seconds. So. In this case, I'm going to keep it set to five. And by the way, the stabilization, the reason I kept it off is because when I'm doing a time lapse, I'm going to want this camera mounted on a tripod stationary. I'm not going to be moving around with the camera. So loop recording is going to be that mode right here where the camera is technically always recording. But if you click the record button, it's then going to go back and save that last fixed length segment. You can actually do a loop duration pretty long on here, though. So that is pretty cool. You can go all the way up to 15 minutes or all the way down to a minute. If you do the loop duration, what's going to happen is it's going to record for that amount of time before it goes back and starts overriding that. So keep that in mind. You can do infinity also, but then if you do infinity, it's going to kind of become like one of the other video modes. So it's up to you how you set that. And you can go up to 4K 60 in that mode. And also, if you swipe over, there's going to be the same settings there again. So slow motion mode. I like to set up my 4K 120 in this. And for the ratio, you can only do 16 by 9. So keep that in mind. It will crop in the camera. Stabilization, I like to keep that set to standard. That usually does quite well there. And duration, I like to keep that set at infinity. And I'm going to swipe left. And I'm going to do the same settings here again. I'm going to do flat. And I'm going to do auto for the shutter. Unless I'm using ND filters. For the ISO, I'm going to do auto. But I'm going to keep it at 800 max. For the EV comp, I'm going to do negative 0.5. And for the white balance, I'm going to once again do 5000K. And those are the only settings I really use for slow motion, so I'm not going to save a preset for this either. Star lapse. Star lapse is a pretty neat mode on here. So this is going to allow you to shoot and store multiple photos and automatically combine them for a star lapse effect. It's really neat that Insta360 has built this into the camera. It's a neat feature. So you can do star lapse video. You can do star trails video which I think is going to be a big feature on here. A lot of people like to use 
and you can do star trails photo. So if you want the camera to do this for you inside it in a video format where it's moving, you'll want to do video. In general, I recommend doing star trails video for the best results. And you can do that ratio of four by three or 16 by nine. I recommend the four by three. That way you can add some movement to it later on, which is pretty cool. And I recommend setting the timer here. That gives you time to push the button to start it and then step away from the camera. You'll want it mounted on a tripod, of course, to not have any movement, but that timer allows the camera to stop moving if there's any movement when you hit record. And then over here, I recommend doing manual settings for this. I like to do the 30 second shutter. That's gonna allow you to get a nice view of the stars in the bright sky. Of course, inside here, it's gonna be super overexposed. For the ISO, this defaults to 2000, but I recommend doing about 1600 for it. If you have a nice dark sky, 1600 is usually going to be sufficient, but you can go all the way up to 6400 for the ISO. But whatever you do, I recommend having the ISO static. You don't want it to change during the star lapse. And for the white balance, I recommend setting that at a static value, and I recommend doing 3800K for best results. I prefer that if you want it a little bit cooler, you can go like 3200K and that'll give you good results as well. And for the lens here, I recommend keeping ultra wide. That's gonna give you a wide open view of the sky. It's gonna capture as many details as possible. So burst photo mode, this basically is a burst of photos like it sounds like. Similar to before, if you go in here, you can set the cache, you can set the burst. So they have a mode that goes up to 30 pictures in one second. That is a lot of photos in one second but there's a ton of different combos on here. I often find I like like 30 pictures in 10 seconds. That can be useful. For the ratio, I recommend four by three. Timer can be useful if you're gonna run back to get in front of the camera and you're standing with a group of people. You can set that all the way up to 15 seconds. So I recommend using that if you're in a situation where you need that. And then for the options over here under manual, you can again change those settings to your preference. For most of these settings, I recommend keeping them set to auto. And for the color profile, I recommend keeping it set to standard there. Next mode is the interval photo mode. So this interval mode is actually what I recommend using if you want to get a photo time lapse and you want to edit those photos later on and put them together into a time lapse. I recommend using this and I recommend doing the 48 megapixels that gives you a really high resolution photo. And I really love the results with that. And for the ratio, I recommend keeping the four by three. And for the interval, this is going to be up to you and what you're doing the photos of. Technically, you could do a night lapse with this as well, because this does allow you to go up to that 30 second interval and then you can set the 30 second shutter speed. But if you're going to do like a daytime time lapse, I recommend three seconds or five seconds or a sunset time lapse. And of course, you can adjust the duration up here, too. I usually just keep it at infinity. I like to start and stop my time lapse when I'm ready for it to stop. And then over here, are some key settings. I like to go under manual here. And I like to keep this at the standard mode. And then if I'm doing something at nighttime, I want to bring the shutter way, way up. And I want to do like 30 seconds. If I'm doing the night sky and a night lapse, if it's daytime, I'm going to probably keep the shutter set to auto unless I'm using an ND filter for this, in which case I would set a static value here, especially for sunsets so that the lighting doesn't change on me. And also, so there's not flicker in here. This camera has a static aperture of f2.6. So if you set the ISO to a static value and the shutter to a static value, you're going to have very little flicker in your time lapse and it's going to look a lot better. But it does usually become necessary to have ND filters. Otherwise, you're going to have too fast of a shutter speed and it's going to make each frame really sharp in your time lapse and it's not going to look great. So for that, I generally recommend keeping your shutter speed at 1 over 120 or below. But again, in most cases, you'll need an ND filter in order to do that. If you don't have an ND filter, just keep it at auto and that's going to still give you good results. There just might be a little bit of flicker there. For the ISO, I do recommend setting it to a static value for time lapses. If it's during the day or sunset, I recommend doing 100 or 200. You can fine tune that when you put on an ND filter. I'll have a whole dedicated video to how to use the ND filters for video and photo results. But I generally recommend setting the ISO to a static value of 100 for time lapses. If you're doing a night lapse, you probably want to bring this up to about 800 for it. For the EV comp, if this is during the day, I recommend negative 0.5, unless you're using ND filters where I recommend zero. If it's at nighttime, I recommend keeping EV set to zero. And then the white balance, I'd recommend a manual static value. That way all of your photos line up with the same value. If it's during the day, I recommend 5,000K for the value. If it's sunset time lapse, I recommend 6,500K. 
And if it's a night lapse, I recommend 3800K. I'm going to have this all set up for a daytime time lapse because those are going to be the ones I do most often with this interval mode. And of course, you can also do HDR photo on here, that high dynamic range. There's not a lot of options with that. You're pretty much locked in with the pure shot. This is for you if you just want to get a pretty much auto photo where the camera decides what looks best in the photo right out of the camera. You're going to want to use this mode right here. And there is, of course, the standard photo mode. If you go into that, you've got some options here. I recommend using the 48 megapixel mode because you're going to get a lot higher quality photo. That'll allow you to crop in later on if you want to. And it gives you some additional editing flexibility. For the format, you do have some options. I recommend the Pure Shot plus Raw. That way you get a raw export that you can do a lot more editing with. You have a lot more flexibility. But then if you don't want that raw photo, you can just use the Pure Shot one. And that's great as well. And I do recommend using that four by three ratio as well. And then for the settings here, I recommend sticking with the standard mode that's gonna have the least amount of baked in color and contrast. I recommend keeping the shutter set to auto. I recommend the ISO, keeping that at auto as well. And for the EV comp, if it's during the day, I recommend negative 0.5. And the white balance for photos, if you're doing a single photo, I would just keep that at auto. And we are all the way back to video mode, so. We have gone through all of the modes on this camera. And by the way, I really like the glow here. It, uh, it's a very neat blue color there. A lot of cameras use red and green or just red, but I like this blue. There's something about it. Only a master of evil, God. And when I have more content for the Insta360 Ace Pro released, you'll be able to check out those videos right here. Thank you.